Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So here we are, just after the ascension. The ascension we would have celebrated on Thursday. And today is the last Sunday of Easter. And on this last Sunday of Easter, here we are, and we're like, well, what now? What are we going to do? I mean, come on, right? And so today I want to take a look at what this ascension means and what life after the ascension means for you and for me, because that's what today is really about. On this last Sunday of Easter, what is it about? What is it that we do in our lives now that the Easter church part of the year is over? Well, number one, as Christians, Easter is never over. Easter is never over. As Christians, we believe that every time we gather in worship, every Sunday is truly a, the celebration of Easter. It is Easter living all over again, because as God God's Easter people, post-resurrection, post-ascension, the Easter lives on. We live in that victory over sin, death, and the devil every day. It is your victory, it is my victory, and it cannot be taken away. Even when we do funerals, that seems so sad. We're celebrating Easter. Because of Easter, we can celebrate a funeral that our loved one or our friend may be dead, but they are alive in heaven with Jesus. So we celebrate Easter. Even during Lent, let me tell you a little secret, even during Lent, even though some people think, oh no, we have to, we have to put away our alleluias and all that, which is a great tradition. That's what is a tradition, helping us to remember the season of Lent. <clears throat> we don't have to really do that. Because even in Lent, Sundays aren't part of Lent. There's still celebrations of Easter. That's how important Easter is for you and for me. It's rooted into our lives. In the day that Christ called us to faith through baptism, he placed that Easter victory, that Easter triumph, that Easter life, that Easter resurrection on you and on me for eternity. <clears throat> Second, what do we do now that Easter is almost done in the church year, and that we're post-ascension. Well, the disciples, I guess, you know, they were kind of all still discombobulated and probably excited and concerned and maybe understanding a little bit more as Jesus spent time with them and the Holy Spirit was now interacting with them. And it's, it's a very clear picture of what happened on that ascension day. Jesus gathered all his disciples and the church together that were around him. They gathered together, and as he gathered together, he blessed them, he breathed on them, he gave them the Holy Spirit, and then he ascended into heaven. And it's amazing to me what happens. As they were ascending into heaven, it says, all all the eyes, all the eyes of those around him were lifted up and they kept watching him go into heaven until he was taken completely out of their sight. But right before he did that, he said this, as I have gathered you together in my ascension, this upward movement, I am also sending you. I'm sending you into the world where, as our epistle lesson for today reminds us, you will suffer. You will have trials, you will have hardship counted a blessing for Jesus. I'm sending you into the world to be my disciples. I'm sending you into the world to be my presence. I'm sending you into the world to be my voice, my hands, my mouth, and my feet. I'm sending you into the world equipped with nothing but my word and my love and my grace to go to a world who needs to be saved. Our lesson was very clear about that today. When we are uh, going through trials and burdens and tribulations, we count it as blessed because we know that Jesus is for us. Nothing can separate us from God. Our faith will come out even stronger because of it. We are going to heaven, but woe to those who don't know Jesus, that don't have salvation, for when they are tried, what good is it of their benefit? For they will only receive the benefit of a life without Jesus for eternity in hell. Our epistle lesson is very, very intently uh, purposeful about sharing that for today. You and I, great. We have trials and tribulations because Satan's attacking us because we believe in Jesus. That's good because we have faith. It means we're with God and it's good because we're strengthened and it's good because God will use it and it's good because we know no matter what happens, we are going to heaven. Listen to me. No matter what happens, even if we die, we are going to heaven and living forever so nothing else really matters because we already have the victory. But for those who don't know Jesus, our friends and our family and our coworkers who don't know Jesus, who don't have that connection and that relationship with him, they are bound for an eternity in hell apart from Jesus. Now, I hope that makes you sad. If it doesn't, I ask you to get on your knees and pray like Jesus did in the garden for today. If you read John 17, he prayed in the garden, first of all, for us as his church, as his people, that we would know him and believe him and be God's, which happened when he gave us the waters of baptism. He gave us faith. We became the church 
children of God. That is our identity. He goes on to pray about those who don't know him, that we as his children would be the ones to carry his faith, his knowledge, his word, and his love out. He desperately prays because it breaks his heart that people don't know him. After all, God's will and whole purpose for everything on earth is that all people come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus and be saved. So if it doesn't make us sad and it doesn't break our heart that people are going to hell, then we need to get down on our knees and pray the prayer in John 17 and make it our prayer so that our eyes and our hearts will be opened. Because that's what we're called to do. Open to see those who need Jesus around us. So God gathers his church in this ascension, but he also sends it in this ascension. He sends it to go out into the world to be his hands and his mouth and his feet. And he tells us in, in the epistle lesson for today, listen, you're going to have struggles. And oh, by the way, I want you to be sober-minded. I don't want you to be murderers or slanderers or, or gossips. I don't want you to be cheats. I want you to remain faithful and, and, and don't commit adultery. I want you to live a life of love. I want you to live a life that, that shows the world who I am. Man, that's a high bar to set because I don't know about you, but I am a sinner. And we all all are sinners, and we all fall short of God's glory. And I tell you what, I mess up all the time. It's scary how bad I mess up. That bar is so high, and the reality is I can do nothing in my life to ever reach that bar or the forgiveness that is above it. But Jesus has come down out of heaven. God sent him to gather us from heaven so that he would die on the cross, rise from the dead, ascend into heaven, and all of our sins would be forgiven, and we would have the assurance of eternal life with him. And then he sends us that promised Holy Spirit as he breathes upon them. He has breathed upon us in baptism, giving us new life, and giving us the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to make us holy, to strengthen us, to be his people, to live out this call in our life, not to be murders or slanders or gossips or cheats, not to hold grudges, not to, to fail in loving, not to commit adultery. You get the point, right? To live as Jesus in this world. The great thing is that we live in this constant state of God's forgiveness where we know that when we mess up, we can cling to him, receive his forgiveness, ask for his help, and he will continue to strengthen us every day to be his people in the world around us. So the church is gathered and sent. And that's what happens here every time you and I gather in this place, whether it's for worship, whether it's for a funeral, whether it's for um, fellowship, whether it's for family game night, whether it's for Bible study, whether it's on this camera right now or on Zoom as some of us have been meeting, no matter what it is, it doesn't matter. When we gather together as God's people, it's because Jesus has brought us together. In his ascension, he has sucked us all up. He has vacuumed us together. He pulls us. He draws us all together in that ascension and makes us his one living body, his church. And as we are gathered, he feeds us in word and in sacrament through baptism, through the Lord's Supper, through confession and absolution, through the power of his word. He feeds and nourishes us in fellowship as we share and bear one another's burdens and share his love with each other. He feeds and nourishes us and strengthens our faith, causing that sanctification to grow with us with the intent purpose of sending us back out in the world where we will have trials and troubles and tribulations, sending us back out there to be counted as a blessing among his people to share his good news. That's what we're called to do. No more excuses of, I don't know what to say, and I'm too shy and embarrassed to do it. No more excuses of, I don't know how to pray with people, I'll just pray to myself. No more excuses of saying, well, I'm tired and I don't have time to do it. No more excuses of, of whatever our human existence comes up with. God, is, his word is urgent. His call is urgent. Jesus, just as he went up into heaven, will be returning soon, and it is urgent that we go into the world and spread his message. It's not the job of the pastor or your church workers. It is our job each individually as baptized, called, and redeemed members of the body of Christ, his church. That is the truth. And lastly, as we get onto this side of the ascension, now what I'm about to say again is not from scripture, it's Pastor Travis's thoughts, and it's how I view a part of the text for today. It's just something I do to help me remember. I've always wondered after our Acts lesson for today what happened to Matthias. Have you ever wondered that? I mean, where did he go? What did he do? We know nothing. His name is never mentioned again in the New Testament. We have no clue what happened to Matthias. And that used to really bug me. I'm like, hey, these guys got together. They fulfilled the Old Testament by choosing somebody to replace Ju Judas's spot. And they called this guy to be part of them. What in the heck happened to him? Where did he go, George? I don't know. Then it dawned on me. Maybe this can be a, a stark reminder to me 
that when I see Matthias' name and realize he's not anywhere else in Scripture, that I'm supposed to fill that spot as his church. That you and I, as the church of Jesus, fill Matthias' spot as we are called to be disciples, gathered and sent for Jesus. As we are called to be disciples, gathered and sent for Jesus. So as we gather together, as often as we can, in any, by any means that we can, let us be fed and nourished in word and in sacrament with forgiveness and love that is unending and grace and mercy that is unconditional and the love of God that is uh, lavished upon us at all times so that we may be strengthened and equipped to march back out in this world sent as God's people, holy and dearly loved, forgiven and redeemed to be the very presence of Jesus to every person we meet. And in so doing, those very people Jesus prayed for in the remainder of John chapter 17, those who do not yet know Jesus, they will come to know. They will get to experience the wonderful reward of salvation that you and I experience every single second of every day. They will be counted among the Lord's saints and we will rejoice with them in heaven for all eternity. This is God's call on our life. I know about you, but it's humbling and it's honoring that the God of the universe who sent Jesus chose poor sinners like you and for me to go into the world to be his presence. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.